I will start with a remark to a presentation I was uh, happy to listen uh, yesterday by Victor Rodriguez Padillo. Uh, he gave a presentation on the role of oil, both paper oil and wet oil, um, well, what the role oil is playing today. And he has argued that the current debate on energy is framed by two big blocks namely by the fossil fuel lobby on the one side and the environmentalists on the other side. Well, and while well, he came to the obvious conclusion, well, maybe not that obvious, but to the pessimistic conclusion that the fossil fuel lobby is going to win. Well, what I will do, at least uh, in the first part of my presentation, to introduce, uh, well, a third block. At least, you know, we are both coming from Europe, both coming from Germany, and uh, in Europe we have a quite vivid discussion on something, well, it's different wording, I will come back on the different wording, this goes under the heading green growth and green economy. And, um, well, this is an approach this is an approach which uh, emerged in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, um, where the green growth narrative was somehow substituting the former quite well distributed narrative of sustainable development. And there is a huge difference between the green growth approach and sustainable development, and as well something which has been also called sustainable growth. Uh, it's a discourse recently uh, quite widespread um, uh, among different, kind, different UN organizations, in particular UNEP, so United Nations Development Organization, but also among European governments, uh, European Union as a whole, but also in South Korea and the United States, you have this. And in the meantime, you have even smaller discussion on this referring uh, to the green growth approach in China. Um, you have the OECD, the media, huge parts of academia, but even uh, quite a number of civil society organizations and NGOs being part of this third block. I would say, well, they try to find something in between the fossil fuel lobby and the environmentalist. Uh, and, well, I will try to, to demonstrate, uh, for, first I will give you some hints what the promises of this green growth approach are, and then I will um, uh, try to uh, demonstrate, or try to argue, not to demonstrate, that uh, actually this green growth approach equates something like a sort of green capitalism. And in the main part of my presentation, I will concentrate on arguments whether something like green capitalism really is possible. And I will argue no, it is not possible, while focusing on the limits of growth, but not that much referring to the damages capitalism is causing on climate, on species, and on, well, on ecosystem as a whole. Uh, this has yesterday been discussed in quite interesting presentation already. Also, Elmer has mentioned it. What I will instead do is to concentrate, let's say, if climate change and species uh, distinction and stuff like that are on the output side of our capitalist system, I will concentrate then in the last part more on the input side, namely on the resources, and not only on fossil fuel resources. And here. Uh, I might um, be forced to put a little bit, I don't know whether one can say this in English, a little water in this uh, very tasty wine of a solar energy system which will emerge. Because I will refer on the minerals and metals necessary to develop some, something like a renewable energy technology. And therefore my arguments, my, the main arguments I want to uh, um, make in my uh, last part is um, that 
even though it is hoped by the uh, proponents of the green growth, green capitalism uh, narrative, that at least capitalism will be able uh, to, no, capitalism will be rescued from its contradiction, its contradiction that, well, accumulation seems to be no longer possible in the same way as before, as has been mentioned by Elmar. Um, but the second argument I want to make is that even though we have to change to renewable energy technology, that's no question about this, but uh, renewable energy technology may be also part of the problem and not only part of the solution, which makes the story a little bit more complicated than it would look at the first glance, because we can say, well, we simply have to transform our energy system. So, um, well, first step, uh, very shortly, uh, this green narrative is expressed in different wording, even though there is a number of common concerns included. So the starting point is always uh, that yes, there is an impeding threat of climate change and also of res resource scarcity. Uh, this is uh, uh, um, the starting point of everybody. Um, also, the declared objective is shared by namely all of the proponents, namely that decarbonizing the global economy is urgently needed. But they use different wording to express this, therefore I give the wording here, so when you run across while reading stuff, you will see that United uh, Nations Development Program uh, um, uh, very often refers to green economy, which is not exactly the same as a green growth approach, uh, which has been uh, mentioned, uh, which is propagated mainly by OECD and World Bank. Um, um, also not 100% identical with the New Green Deal. The New Green Deal was something like a rescue uh, program during the financial crisis framed by the G20 countries in order to help the countries out of the crisis uh, while they were referring to this green growth uh, program. It was in particular in South Korea a very important uh, uh, measure in order to well solve, uh, uh, at least for some time, uh, the uh, uh, crisis. Under the ILO, the International Labour Organization, the same approach goes under the heading of, well, green job sh jobs should be stimulated in parallel with sustainable development, so ILO is somehow in between the old discourse and the new one. And in the European Union, you have now a new wording coming up. It goes uh, under the heading of bioeconomy, and it's, it's a wording which, um, which uh, is applied by a lot of EU institutions, and it looks first on to uh, technological innovation uh, in order to enhance efficiency of resource uses, but uh, it's also addressing food, energy, pharmaceutical, and chemical industries. So it's proposing it's, and it is recommending this approach as a way out of the economic crisis. And this is why I will sometimes refer to European stuff, because you know there you can see very, very easily that this green growth approach definitely is a growth approach mainly, and not, well, well but with the green elements as a new driver of growth. So the common concerns uh, uh, are, um, uh, they include, well, inefficient use of scarce resources should be avoided, uh, efficiency in the use of uh, any resource should be increased uh, via technological innovation, um, and the consumption pattern should be changed of all of us. But what is also shared by all these different approaches, you know, going under the same, under different headings, but the same ideas, is that um, the main aim is that still GDP should be able to grow because this is taking as an indispensable, uh, indispensable need in order to reduce poverty. So this is, let's say, the basic of you know, all the approaches. We need growth because otherwise you cannot avoid uh, reduced poverty. Uh, no debate whether it has been reduced with high growth rates, so let's 
uh, let's uh, uh, ignore this for a second, but in combination with these elements, which in former times has been addressed by the so-called environmentalist approach. So therefore I say it's a combination of the two approaches. Um, so actually why is this green growth approach, the green economy stuff so interesting? Well, um, I would argue because it's promising a win-win situation. Everybody is going to win. You know, therefore it's so charming. Um, so the argument goes investment into the energy sector, investment in public infrastructure, in environmental protection. This will help to generate additional jobs and at the same time create low carbon infrastructure. Um, uh, it will, by the way, help to increase national energy security, meaning uh, countries have to import less energy and this makes them more independent and in terms of foreign policy. Uh, and uh, it will also create uh, competitive advantages through technological leadership. And this is a particular issue which is very, very important for European Union being, well, uh, 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 usually taken as a best case example to, uh, to advertise this green growth approach because European Union actors, they really uh, are quite uh, uh, um, um, convinced that they become technological leaders in this area. So, argument is everybody will be better off with a green economy, with a green growth approach because new investment opportunities will be created, uh, uh, new profits for business are also created, workers could look for new jobs, maybe even better jobs, maybe even more interesting jobs, better paid jobs, and uh, then and better paid also means they can consume more, and this again has a, uh, is a driving force for the economy as a whole, and government, you know, if the economy will grow again, uh, then government can hope that they will be able um, to reduce debt levels. And yes, the environment will be protected and future generation can look forward to live in a world that is really worth living. In short, higher efficiency will reduce the cost for energy and material and thus could allow households to spend more on consumption and would allow business to invest more in fixed capital. That's the promise. Um, if I will would concentrate it on more uh, systematic, in a, in a more systematic way, I would say what the green narrative is, uh, uh, is, um, is based on, it's first, well, we need new kind of intelligent, it's called in the OECD, macroeconomic policies. We uh, need technical advances in the form of new products, in the form of new processes, in the form of new services, and not to forget all the geoengineering mega projects are necessary, all based on the market principle and better management and better institutions. And certainly some would argue also some more government intervention, but I come back on this because this is not shared by everybody that government should intervene into the market forces in order to stimulate this green growth stuff. And not to forget, a renewed round of enclosure and commodification of nature uh, should be started. With all this taken into consideration, the expectation is that something like qualitative growth, so that's the wording in particular in Germany, uh, or sustainable growth uh, can be created, meaning a kind of growth that is largely not coupled to environmental damages and growing resource uh, consumption as the old industrial uh, 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 society paradigm is. That's the idea. Well, as I already said in my introduction, um, that um, such optimism from my point of view very, e very obviously indicate uh, that it's basically synonymous with a sort of green capitalism. 
So the elements of the idea that capitalism can be transformed into a new form, but will survive as an economic system, as an economic and ecological system, the idea is that green capitalism stands for low carbon, resource efficient, highly competitive economy, which is driven by the intention to extend the limits of growth. So Elmer has talked about the limits of growth and the idea, which is very, very familiar, for instance, among German Green Party members, that the limits of growth can be extended via these mechanism I have just uh, mentioned. Uh, with the core assumption uh, uh, being that unavoidable externalities, so for instance, CO2 emissions, uh, if they would be priced, a uh, market would do their magic work and the economy keep, could keep on growing ne uh, nearly indefinitely. Uh, second assumption is, yes, it seems to be that private actors will not well, follow this path easily and voluntarily. Therefore, government intervention is needed to compensate market failures, but only as an enabler of green economic activity. Activity itself is supposed to originate from the private sector and government only should support the private actor in following the right uh, uh, pathway toward a greener, brighter future. And third assumption is, uh, I cannot, uh, I will not discuss this in detail, that low carbon production can substantially dematerialize economic activity. So what is, you know, what is the meaning behind de dematerializing economic activity? There is an idea that I can construct the share there with much less uh, energy and much less material. But one doesn't have to be a natural scientist to know that the possibility to dematerialize the share, so uh, use less and less material in order to construct a share, will not be the point where 50% uh, uh, is uh, only used, because then maybe I and you all will avoid to sit on the share. So there are limits. Yes, you can use less material to construct something, uh, but obviously you cannot use uh, uh, simply 10% of cement in order to construct uh, a bridge. Nobody would like to cross this bridge anymore. I, I think so. Uh, but this, this is an idea still behind. We can do uh, more with less. So this is uh, the very simple explanation for this. So actually, the message is that human civilization, yes, they have to reduce the impact on the planet. So therefore, they are not part of the fossil fuel lobby. But the socioeconomic system of capitalism does not need to be fun fundamentally reconstruct uh, restructured. It can stay as it is. Um, uh, new green investment, that's the wonderful message coming out of it. New green investment and accumulation, the new green accumulation regime, you can say, will solve the over-accumulation crisis, which is doing harm to the world economy for so long time. So in a way, one can say green growth is the most recent material semiotic a reformulation of nature society relation offered by contemporary uh, capitalism. Obviously, there is a lot what the green growth approach does not really take into account or don't deal with it seriously. So first of all, sure, it's not dealing with a capitalist mode of production and exploitation. Instead, nature is reframed as a specific type of capital which needs to be, capital always needs to be measured, conserved, produced, even accumulated. So now the same goes with nature, if I take nature as a sort of capital. So what the green growth approach actually is doing, or the green capitalist approach is actually doing, is isolate elements of an unmeshed relationship, bringing into being such strange categories as genes, as something we can uh, externalize, commodifies, monetize, and then exchange, or carbon sinks or pollination. 
So actually everything which goes under ecosystem services, which is this new category where new sorts of nature are created as capital. Um, secondly, obviously property rights and the issue of so social justice is not taken into account so that some have access to something other don't have and therefore also the role of market regulation and its limit and neither uh, the rules and regulation of free trade and the malfunctioning of financial markets. All this is left out from this green growth uh, debate. But what is particularly left out, and this will be the points on which I will now concentrate, is the biophysical base of a green economy and the geopolitical tension around um, uh, raw material scarcity, because I will not concentrate that much on oil, but on raw material scarcity, because this is linked to the green economy approach, substituting fossil fuel as our main base of energy. Um, well, this I can make short because uh, 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 Elmer has already uh, mentioned it, so there are a number of reasons why, which one can use in order to uh, demonstrate that green capitalism definitely cannot function. So one is uh, referring to the very famous argument Elmer has already mentioned, the so-called Jevron paradox or the rebound effect or backfire effect, which has to do with the problem that yes, I can stimulate why increasing technology efficiency, I will have as a result uh, um, uh, that the relative cost of producing one item are lessened. Uh, yes, I can, if I increase the efficiency, so use less energy, less material in order to construct a car. Uh, obviously, everybody here in the room knows that uh, car producers will not stop when they have produced 100,000 cars, you know, only because they use less energy and less material. They will go ahead, so they will produce more of the same or use it to invest in other areas in, to, in order to produce there. And also consumers who have now, well, maybe uh, they have more, a more effic uh, efficient uh, uh, fridge, uh, they will not simply uh, stop working, they will use their, the money they have saved because it's more efficient, consumes less energy st and so on, to buy something either similar or another uh, item so that fin in the final end, growth is still increasing. So we have this problem and with growth increasing, uh, this means, well, obviously, in particular at the output side, also uh, 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 emissions are increasing. Uh, so therefore, this is really no solution at all. Empirically, it's quite well proven through a lot of studies that uh, never so far we had something like absolute decoupling, decoupling grows from, on the one hand, resource use, and on the other hand, emission. Decoupling means that for each unit of, let's say, one dollar, I use less uh, material and I emit less. So all the calculation which has been done uh, came to the conclusion that there was a particular period where real, in, in, in some regions, for instance in Europe, yes, we had a reduction of CO2 emission, but this was mainly due to the do breaking down of the economies and post in the post-Soviet realm, so the industry were, uh, were ruined, and therefore, yes, you had less emissions. In absolute terms, we had nothing like this. What we have seen in the, in the, in the past due to technological advances is that we have an, had an improvement in the so-called clean pollution. So yes, the rivers and the lakes have become uh, uh, um, um, less polluted and there's also less air pollution today uh, and less acid drain, but when it comes to, because this you can do really very nicely with technological advances and people can profit from it, well, regarding the most serious issues like CO2 emissions, species distinction, and declining water reserves, stuff like this, there is nothing like a decoupling from growth to all these effects. Uh, further, uh, and maybe I can uh, uh, use this graph immediately, further, uh, the argument uh, goes that, well, we can substitute one kind of natural resource by the others. So it's very often the, the debate, well, we can use 
renewable resources in order to substitute, substitute the non-renewable one. And the non-renewable one obviously are fossil fuel. Uh, we know we are running out of it. So yes, what you see there in red, while well, the expectation is because there is no, not that much left anymore, uh, well, actually they will still uh, increase uh, the consumption of fossil fuel. But what you can also see even in the back, that the light blue and the dark green and the, uh, and the light green, that these bars are even increasing more rapidly until 2013, uh, according to all uh, estimation. And what is behind here is on the one hand, the blue stands for metals, the green stands for minerals, and the light green stands for biomass. So yes, I can use biomass instead of fossil fuel uh, in order to, uh, to get energy. But then I don't have the biomass available anymore for agriculture. Or I can make it also uh, very simple. I can use a piece of land, not threefold. I cannot use it on the one hand for the production of biofuel in order to feed cars, and at the same time for ecological agriculture or for housing and infrastructure building. You know, there is one, you can use it only one time. So, and if you shift from the so-called renewable, uh, non-renewable resources to renewable ones, well, you have the problem that the shortage will appear uh, somewhere else. This has to do with the absolute limits which are ignored by the green growth discourse. There is nothing like absolute limits accepted. Um, so, I w at, at this point, I wanted to, uh, um, no, um, so let, let, let's, let, I, I don't want to refer to the output uh, elements. So the most important argument why green growth approach is really very, very problematic is that you know, the, the results will be quite negative anyway. Uh, and you cannot turn things back. You know, there's this very famous saying, I always use it in order to demonstrate what it means. You can change from, not from me, you can always change a fish, a pool where uh, fishes are swimming into a fish soup, but never the other way around. So what you have here, this is um, uh, the invention of the Australian Bureau of Meteorology from last year. I guess they will, in, they will show something new in this year. It's a new color which has been invented. It's a color purple, which didn't exist in meteorology until last year. It's a color indicating these periods of the year when the, when the temperature in the center of Australia is moving up to more than 50, more than uh, 46 degrees, because this was a dark red we are used to, you know, when it's become very hot, you know, it's dark red. And now they had to introduce a new color, and this is for the temperature going up uh, above this limit. And recently, we have the same kind of temperature in the chart. In the chart we have in Africa, we have recently, or we had during the summer, temperature of 25 to, uh, uh, 52 to 56 degree, a temperature where you, no human being is really able to live, also not Africans who are really adapted to quite hot uh, uh, temperature. So this is one thing I don't want to refer to all the other indicators. Maybe uh, uh, this indicator also gives you a nice hint linking my argumentation back to what Elmer has said, you know, Elmer has showed you the graph from Madison and the very end of his presentation, you know, where you can see, well, the growth was climbing up incredibly, in particular during uh, the period since the middle of the 20th century, so since 2015, uh, something. So, yes, it's about, you know, these area, which is called the Anthropocene by uh, some people, other call it Capitalocene, uh, starting with the Industrial Revolution, but obviously, the really, well, the driving forces or, the, you know, the push really came uh, in the middle of the last century only. And this is indicated somehow by these interesting graphs showing you the many types of disasters we are confronted with. So the first uh, blue one stands for uh, extreme temperature and drought. The second, the red one, stands for storms, the other for floods and the uh, um, light blue one for earthquakes and uh, the green one for epidemics. What you can see, uh, maybe not in the back, but you know, this is a period from the year 90, uh, 1900 until today. 
And what you can easily see is that, you know, when, when the colors become, you know, brighter and brighter, you know, you see more, more droughts, more storms, more floods appearing. This is definitely uh, starting in the 50s and then is emerging quite heavily in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So it's not that uh, former generation didn't violate, you know, these Earth system as we do, but it's definitely uh, uh, a question of dimension. Um, so we, but we can argue. Um, I don't know. May, maybe I leave the European example out. Uh, we can argue uh, in a way um, that well. Also, the quote Elmer has used from Naomi Klein. Well, we really didn't expect anything else from capitalism. Really, capitalism is ignoring these output of you know its functioning. Um, um, so, in a way, uh, the argument goes: it's a fight of capitalism against the climate, but not only against the climate, also against biosystem and and all the other ecological and physical system on which we, but not only we, also other species are depending. So in a way, it's not astonishing uh, uh, what we know from capitalism. But um, they are argument, and therefore uh, I started with this green uh, growth um, um, approach, uh, that the argument goes, well, at least we can rescue capitalism from its own contradiction when we turn capitalism into a greener one. You know, this is another argument saying, well, obviously, we, we are not really fit to avoid these negative externalities, as they would say, you know, this destruction of ecological and physical system. But if we can turn capitalism into a greener one, well, we could use the incredible forces capitalism always had, you know, these, these, these imaginary uh, stuff, you know, the, the, the innovation, you know, the modernity, which is based on, well, capitalism can adapt, and capitalism can even adapt to the challenge uh, which we put now under the coin of, you know, the green, the green challenges. Capitalism can adapt. So the question is, uh, no, my argument, which I now want to elaborate a little bit further, is that um, um, <clears throat> that maybe when we look, it's a counter argument against against these green hopes. When we look at the resource constraints, not that much on the output side of the capitalist economy and societies around the world, but on the input side, namely uh, on the resources which are consumed. Maybe we can see that the constraints for capitalism as a combined ecological and socioeconomic system uh, are really uh, quite heavily. So the argument, the counter argument uh, I want to make is that when we concentrate a little bit more on the input side, we will see that constraints for capitalist accumulation are quite heavy and are ignored uh, by the screen optimist. Um, so uh, you all know that the peculi uh, when, we, when we discuss about the peculiarities of capitalism, well, it's not the case that, you know, uh, former societies, they didn't know anything like uh, um, destruction of human and non-human nature. Neither can we say that profit making and exploitation of human labor was not existing in uh, societies which were non-pre-capitalist societies. We have this all. But there's one thing which is really uh, particular about capitalism, a, dim a dimension in which it di distinguishes itself from all other economic, socio-economic, as well as ecological systems existing, namely its movement toward the infinite. So since Elmer has already mentioned this, since only continuous new investment can generate new surplus value, markets have to keep expanding beyond all needs. And market actors have to grow, otherwise they will disappear. You know, that's, that's the iron rule in capitalism. You grow or you disappear. And this uh, is something uh, which is addressed to farmers, uh, 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 in Europe, for instance, you say either you grow or you will disappear. But this is also addressed to uh, any other capitalist 
uh, cooperation. Um, the important precondition for value... Oh, 10 minutes only. Now, now I have a problem here. Um, uh, the precondition for uh, valorization of nature um, uh, actually is, and we should uh, remember this uh, quote from, from Marx, that there are free gifts of nature available. Free gifts of nature, so the natural riches. Uh, with this, Marx had in mind something which is, which is not the outcome of human labor, which is existing, you know, which we get for nothing, so even not working for it. But the point is, only if these free gifts, so mineral, energy, agricultural resources, are not part of the capital advance, only then, so meaning not part of previous labor, only then they will increase uh, the wealth of the private owners and can be appropriated and then transformed into, uh, uh, well, enclosures and then can be exploited. Um, and this was a process of primitive accumulation. Marx has described so nicely, but the point is, it's, this process is still ongoing. Um, we always, there is always a search for this new frontier where you have free gifts which are not yet the product of combination of capital and labor. But the point is, and the big question is, and here comes my argument, uh, that, well, when we have a closer look at these, well, free gifts of nature, well, one can really doubt whether they are still there in such quantities and so easily accessible as the one we already have exploited. And this obviously will then uh, create a limit to capitalist accumulation. Uh, because capitalist accumulation always requires new frontiers, so new free gifts which not already have been turned into capital. And uh, why the use of labor? When I do this, then I have a problem with my accumulation uh, process. Um, so I will not touch on this. Re oh, referring to the different kind of resources, yesterday there was a huge discussion on this, on the peak oil issue. Here, it, it's simply a graph showing you that the peak of production of oil for most countries already have been reached. Yes, there are some who are not yet uh, in, in the peaking period, but yesterday it has been already mentioned by several of the speakers that we can expect that the declining rate of production, some argue, well, it will be 3% per year. I don't really deal with these numbers. So there is a declining rate, and you know the question is only, will it be a sharp? Uh, uh, on, on the other side of the curve, will it go quickly down, or will it go slowly down? And the more we produce, the quicker, obviously, it will go down. But this is not uh, the main point. What I want now to refer to in order to address the issue of capital accumulation is, it's always pointed to the unconventional oil resources uh, and, or, and gas resources. And yes, uh, there, are, there are still a number of it existing, no question. But what you can see from this graph, maybe even in the back, what you see is the dark colors here indicating uh, the newly discovered field found in uh, deep sea, so uh, below two, 400 meters. While the, um, the, the very light ones are the one uh, on shore and, and flat water. And you can see, well, if there are new discoveries, they are mainly in the deep sea or in the, at least, uh, not onshore, uh, there are no more any well, uh, big uh, fields to be discovered. But what is linked to it is what you can see on the second graph. On the second graph, you see, you see the cost of deep sea drilling in comparison, in comparison to uh, flat water. Uh, and, um, well, the darkest red is the deepest water. So, uh, 3,000 meter or even deeper. Uh, and what you can see, that the cost of drilling are, are many fold compared to even to flat water, not to compare with onshore. And this is the main point we have to understand. So what is the effect when it becomes more expensive? Well, you do the drilling, you do the drilling only when you expect a high oil or gas price to appear in the near future. And um, if you have and this brings me to my geopolitical issue, where when you have competition on these issues, um, well, you will see that 
even though we are approaching maybe the peaking of oil or already have approached it in terms of world production, countries who are depending on oil exports, they do production uh, like, uh, like the devil, you know, because they are dependent on these resources. So you do the production on the resources and this makes the exploration cost even higher because you really have to risk a lot when you do this. You know, you have to expect that the return on investment in the next future will show up and not in 20 years the oil price will be high, but you know that you can realize a very high oil price, otherwise these kinds of costs are not covered. So you have a contradiction. We are reaching, and, and then I will leave the, the element of oil because it has been discussed yesterday. You have the problem, yes, everybody knows that this is a, is a resource we cannot really substitute. We cannot make a, a, a pharmaceutical out of a renewable energy, uh, out of sun energy. You know, we really need oil for this, and we need oil for a lot of very important issues. Definitely not to drive cars. You know, this, for this we don't need oil, but, but you, know, you need oil. But nevertheless, the production is, is increasing recently, or at least stays stable, uh, while the costs are decreasing. So it, the, the probability that the peak oil will appear even earlier uh, is, uh, is very high. So this is a result of this. But this brings me, no, well, this is a graph simply showing, yes, we have a lot of oil available, but the point is, uh, uh, what is still there, it's slower to extract, and this means it is more expensive to extract. So let's stay with this very simple argument. This graph gives you an idea of what Elma has already touched in terms of the energy return on energy investment of the different sources. What you saw, saw, see there at the highest bar, this is um, the energy return on energy invested in the US in the, uh, in the 30s, you know, when there was an oil boom. You had a return uh, which, was, uh, which, which was, I always forgot the numbers, uh, which was nearly 80 to, well, nearly 100 to, uh, 100 to 1, at least 80 to 1. And this has decreased to domestic oil production in the U.S. Uh, uh, in the year 2000 to uh, simply an euro of 1 to 15. So you need 15, uh, uh, you need, uh, 15 uh, units uh, uh, of energy in order to get out one. Uh, no, you need uh, it's the other way around. Uh, you need one, and you get out only 15. Uh, but the point Alma has made with renewable energy resources uh, is even more severe. The low, uh, um, the low our eroy of wind energy is 18 to one, depending technological in, uh, in the advances could increase this eroy. Then it becomes a little bit higher. But in solar for photovoltaic, it's only 10 to one. Uh, and sometimes, depending if you have, if you use very old technology, even three to one, and ethanol, it's uh, it's a mess. It's three to one, so it really makes no sense to uh, to use ethanol uh, as as a as a source. Um, the point is also very clear. Uh, in oil and gas, you have already a condensed form of energy. Well, obviously, you first have to. Uh, to, to store, so to, 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 you first have to concentrate solar energy, and then you have to store it, and then you have to transport it. So this is a point: renewable energy technology. They are not cheap, and they will, in the near future, not become cheap. And this really brings us to one of the main contradictions of, of the green capitalist approach, because this means they will only get a chance to compete against the brown fossil fuels, so coal, coal, gas, and, uh, and oil, if you really do what? Um, I skip this. Um, you will have to decide to leave the fossil fuels in the ground. Otherwise, there is no chance for renewable energy technologies to grow up because EROI is much lower. You have to invest in all the infrastructure while the infrastructure for, for the oil and gas production is already there. You don't have to invest in it, you know, but you have to find somebody who invests. And governments obviously are not able to do. And therefore, you know, why should private investors go into these areas if they still can make quite a lot of money um, when drilling and burning the fossil fuels? So uh, this is the point. Uh, one has to take very seriously because who should convince financial investors to, um, to well, to leave these assets? Uh, the point is, 
also governments are afraid of. You know, if there would be, yes, I know, there is a huge movement uh, in the United States, in South Africa and in other places, which goes under divestment. So trade unions, churches, civil society organizations, communities, uh, municipalities, they sell their assets in fossil fuels and then reinvest in renewable energy technology. But the point is, well, they simply sell it. Somebody is buying the assets, right? You know, and the question is, where are, who are these people who are buying it? Will it be better than the fossil fuel, let's say this very dirty coal uh, uh, power plant is under the control of somebody you have even no idea who it is. So yes, there are a lot of contradiction included, even though I say, well, this would be a precondition for something like a green capitalism that you first have, well, to leave the stuff in the soil. The second uh, um, a point I want to make, and I ask you for giving me this opportunity, uh, is that uh, when we are addressing renewable energy technologies, we may see that there will be uh, a shift in terms of problems now concentrated on the fossil fuels to minerals and metals. And that we, and linked to it, we will have even higher competition, or not only competition, rivalries, because minerals and metals are even uh, as much concentrated in some countries as oil and gas is. Um, so this is the as a similar cor cor uh, uh, curve you have uh, regarding, you know, discovery of major oil fields and gas fields. You have a similar picture when you look at the mineral deposits. What, you, what we do have is that the, the wonderful deposits of lead, silver, copper, nickel, and all the stuff we need for an industrial society and economy to exist at acceptable prices. And this is now the main argument I make. It, it's always in capitalism about the price and not only the resource, you know? At an acceptable price, this must mean that it's easy to harvest. And when it's difficult to harvest, then the price climbs up. And then the big question is, will I still try to exploit these, well, these reserve, which is there of uranium or nickel or other minerals? And you can see, well, on the one hand, uh, um, the number of major de 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 deposit uh, discoveries, so these are the blue ones, they are going down, while the green line, that's the exploration expensive, going up. So you have, you know, the share going up like this. It's the same as with oil. Um, um, therefore, the argument is that the world is heading toward an acute metal scarcity. Metal scarcity means, uh, or is defined, not by me, but, you know, in, in, in the literature, as defined as having a concentration um, in parts per miller range. So if, uh, uh, the point is, if it's concentrated to a very low degree, you call it scarce, even though there is a lot of this mineral still existing. But you know, if the concentration is very low, it becomes very, very difficult, and from an economic point of view, not really feasible uh, to exploit it. You leave it, uh, except you know, uh, prices are skyrocketing. And here you find, you know, from the most important minerals, some I gave you uh, here, uh, where argument goes from geologists that they are close to a peak production, while a number of others um, might experience peak production within the next 10, uh, 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 30 years. So this is the reason why, um, what is this now? Okay, this is a study uh, conducted for uh, the European Union. What you can see here, well, what you don't see, what there is a, is a red, uh, is a group of minerals in the red, uh, uh, in, in the red ellipse and in an orange and the green one. And only the few and the green one, this is what the European Union said, there is a low risk that there will be scarcity appearing in the nearest future. Well, in the middle you have uh, those uh, minerals uh, and metals with a uh, middle, uh, with a moderate risk that there will be severe scarcity. And all what is in the red, that is a high risk that in the near future we will see uh, scarcity. And scarcity turns now these minerals into strategic minerals. Strategic means, well, it, every country is depending on this. You know, we can't do nothing without these minerals, actually, uh, and metals. And so the question comes up, I should be quicker. Um, well, this is now addressing the point, uh, I have to uh, be short, therefore I uh, just mention it. 
When we speak about renewable energy technologies, we speak about such interesting uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, minerals like uranium, deprosium, indium, platinum, lithium, lanthanum, rhodium, and a lot of others. You know, they are necessary uh, to, for, for nuclear reactors, they are necessary for photovoltaic, they are necessary for catalysts, for batteries. So all our wonderful renewable energy te technologies, they are depending on these m minerals, and most of them are really, on the one hand, they are scarce, meaning that it's easy only with high cost to uh, extract, and on the other hand, uh, they are uh, um, not available for, um, for everybody. And this is my last point I want to mention. So, but first, let me concentrate on this. Uh, so we have to see that scarcity has a threefold meaning. First, there is this physical scarcity. You know, the not, that, that there's stuff not available anymore or not accessible. Yes, it's in the deep water, but very difficult to access. We have depletion of reserves. This goes under physical scarcity. And then we have the economic scarcity it has to do with the price. Yes, it might be available, but a lot of countries are not no longer able to, uh, to, to survive with an oil price of let's say again $80, $80 uh, uh, because most of developing countries are not oil exporting countries but oil importing countries and therefore the economic dimension of scarcity is as important as the physical one. But in addition we have a geopolitical scarcity. Uh, a lot of these metals and resources are concentrated in some countries and what we are now uh, facing uh, uh, as a consequence of it is the appearance first of green trade wars, trade wars on metals and scarcities around, in particular those we need for renewable en te energy technology at the same time for our wonderful smartphones and other information technology. They need the same sort of minerals and metals and not to forget the weapon industry. They all need the same sources and they are competing as industries on the axis and then the problem comes up, so where are these sources? And this uh, I give you as a, as a picture, even though you cannot see it, what you see here, it's a net import balance of the United States in 2007, referring to some of these very important strategic minerals. Strategic means it's not only energy, everything we are producing are depending on these minerals. Uh, and you see there, well, they have a very high import dependency on most of these minerals, but regarding the European Union, the situation is even worse. Uh, regarding the European Union, um, most of the resources on which our advanced industry and living is depending are um, identified as, on the one hand, important for our economy, this is, you know, uh, this is what, uh, 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 the importance is one dimension, and the other dimension is supply risk. And then you see, regarding most of these minerals, European Union is to 100% dependent on imports. And now the question is, well, where do uh, the um, metals are coming from? Well, uh, regarding uh, those uh, metals, uh, uh, um, minerals uh, uh, on which renewable energy technology is depending, a lot is coming from China. China is producing 90% uh, of it, and the problem with China is it has not only the minerals. Minerals and metals are also quite widespread, as we know, in Africa. But in contrast to Africa, China has, a, no, China has cheap labor, China ignores environmental standards, China has a will to produce final products out of it, and China has also intellectual knowledge to do so. And this is a problem now showing up, that if these strategic minerals and metals are concentrated in countries which are no longer simply exporting the resources but producing final products out of it, we have what we already see as a starting uh, uh, as a starting development, namely trade wars going on. So there yeah, is a trade war against China within WTO uh, waged by European Union together with the United States against China. I don't want to elaborate on this case here. 
uh, but you will have it maybe in the former, uh, in former times against Bolivia, if Bolivia would be able to produce something out of lithium, if it really could start doing this, then this will be a problem. Uh, so um, I also had something on the financialization of nature. I, 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 I leave it here. Uh, uh, f the argument would be also financialization of nature will not save capitalism from its own contradiction. Um, uh, but in particular, labor productivity is a very important issue. Um, uh, labor productivity uh, must increase in order to have a, a high profit rate. You know, if I, on the one hand, for capital, using um, increasing amounts in terms of the raw materials I need, energy I need, uh, um, and spending more on this, and then have uh, a stagnating labor productivity, then again, um, we'll see not uh, well, a rescue in terms of the accumulation crisis, but just the contrary. And finally, the result will be also the end of cheap labor. Because if you don't have sheep food available, and this depends on the, on the, on the fruitile land which is available still, um, then you will, in the final end, also have a problem to have sheep labor. And if labor cost increasing, well, there is no solution at all for uh, uh, the accumulation crisis to be saved. So I had here some conclusions, but we have an opportunity tomorrow. Uh, so I draw not the conclusion now, but maybe tomorrow in order to stay somehow in the limit of the time. Thank you a lot for your attention.